But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus is so, is so controversial, not only for what he says, but for who he associates with. And that is in, in this stage in the gospel narrative that is getting Jesus into increasingly hot water. So we're going to jump uh, over the page in my Bible, which is to verse 11. He's spoken about the parable of the lost sheep. Uh, talk about the parable of the lost coin. And in his crosshairs are the Pharisees. And I think the Pharisees get a bad press. If you've ever been into church and you hear about the Pharisees, they're kind of like the pantomime villains. Boo, he's behind you. Um, they're, they're seen, they get a bad press. But actually, they, they have they, their hearts in some ways, they're earnest. They're deeply religious. They want to make Israel great again. They, they are, they are, they are, They are fearful of Roman occupation. Their values are being eviscerated. All that they hold to be true, the things, they just, in the the threat of an invading culture, they just want to hold true to the things that are theirs and and sincere. And, And so they come up with ways and systems to try and please God. And it's, and it's them that Jesus is addressing. Jesus is directly speaking to them. And Jesus uses stories. Uh, in fact, a lot of the parables are stories, and each one of those stories reveals his heart, something of the truth of the gospel. And here we go, verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I love this, verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and I'll go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out to one of his servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fat calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. Amen. Oh, it's one of my favorite, favorite stories in the gospel. I love it. I love it. And there's a lot we could say about it. You'll be relieved to know 
that we're not going to say all of it. We're going to just jump into a couple of things. So I want to to, to make sense of this passage. We're going to we're going to we're going to dive. We're going to dive right in. So what is happening here? Well, there's two. There's three characters. There's the younger son. There's the father, and then there's the older brother. And what happens is the story starts off, and, and Jesus is the most amazing orator. Some say that he was almost like a stand-up comic. He's, he's, he, he, some of his stories are really funny. Some, of, some of that's lost on, on us because we don't always get the context. But, but let me just give you an example. He starts off by saying there's a man who has two sons. And people go, oh, yeah, we get this. Because in, in Hebrew culture, the oldest son was always responsible. If you have any siblings, raise a hand if you were the older sibling. Is that true? Are you the most, are you sensible? Yeah, of course you are. You can tell. You're all. Uh, and then, and then there was, in this culture, the younger brother was always the waster. If you're a younger child, raise a hand. Is that true, folks? Come on. Okay, so the story's starting, and people are like, yeah, we get where this is going. Ha, 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 ha. The younger one. And, he, and he's beginning to tell a story of, 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 of somebody who's beginning to redefine what life looks like for them. So the younger brother here is, he, he wants to pursue freedom. He wants to pursue his own life. He has a sense of destiny in his heart that he now wants to pursue, a sense of where it is he's going to go, what it is he's going to do. And the story starts off in a kind of comedic way, and then it gets more intense and more serious because the younger brother goes to the dad and he says, I want what is mine now. So he knows that there are inheritance laws, and he says, "Um, I, I want... I want what is mine now. So really what he's saying is, I actually don't want you. I want your stuff. Now that is pretty shocking, but it's even more shocking in in a kind of traditional culture, which is defined by honor and shame. You see, you would never, ever, ever say, you'd never, you'd ne- in, in this world, you, you never think of yourself. You always think about how your behavior reflects on your family, and specifically, it reflects on your father. So in some senses, you don't have freedom. Your freedom is limited because there is an expectation, however you live, reflects on your family. So it must be quite constraining. And so people are listening to the story, and they're like, flip, man. This kid is dead, because that's what they're expecting. They're expecting the father to say, yeah, okay, you've asked me that. You're dead to me. In fact, the father could, within the framework of the culture of the time, he could have probably killed him. He certainly could have banished him, but he and he certainly could have beaten him with the inch of his life, because the father wants to protect his honor. So if you imagine you're listening to this story now, you are like, oh my goodness, this family is so dysfunctional. And yet you'd be really intrigued because Jesus says, well, what the father does is unthinkable because the father liquidates a third of his assets and gives it to the boy. So the younger son, he leaves everything. He pursues his own sense of self. He, he pursues his desires. He leaves the protection of the father. He leaves the covering of the father's household. And he lives his independent life. One of the things that we reflected on last week is how do we define sin? Sin is, is living a life that is independent of God. It is, is it, it is saying that I'm, I'm autonomous. My life is my own. I, have the lights suddenly gone bright? Or is this like a, 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 a are, we, are we on the road to Damascus? What's going on? Is that you, Jesus? Wow, there you go. Get my shades on. There's a sense that, that I live independently. I live for myself. And this is an example of, of the boy who is now estranged from his father. He is pursuing his own things. And life doesn't go too well for him. This is what the scriptures tell us. It says he, set, he sets off to a distant land, a distant country. He squandered his wealth. He would have had a huge amount of money. This, this, the story we are told, Jesus describes it such a way that, that they're a wealthy family. So he's got a shed load of cash. And when you've got a shed load of cash, you can find a shed load of friends. Imagine you're a fresher here and you've got 100 quid in cash and you're buying everybody a drink. And the pub tonight after church, uh, let us know, we'll come with you. And um, you're going to have a lot of friends. 
Because they're like, you are super generous. And he has a great time and it all runs out. And he ends up living in a place where he's a severe famine. And actually the, the crux of it is in, in verse 15 where the money runs out, the friends run out, the, the de self-desire to live life for himself just doesn't work out. Just life hasn't worked out the way he wanted. He's chosen freedom. He left home. He didn't work out. And the way that we know it doesn't work out is he's a Jewish man who has had to uh, go and hire himself out in a famine as if he's now a refugee. He's, he's in a line for jobs. He's queuing with the refugees. He's queuing with the people who have nothing, trying to eke out a living. And life is so bad, a farmer says, all right, mate, I'll give you a job, cash in hand. No income tax or VAT. Uh, but you've got to sort look after the pigs. Now, pigs and Jews don't get on. And there's this moment where he comes, the Bible says he comes to his senses, where he's looking at the food the pigs are eating. When I was at primary school, the food that we didn't eat went into this massive steel bowl in the middle of the, uh, the, middle of the hall. It was this mountain of terrible food. And that went to the local pig farm in the West Midlands. They loved it, apparently. They, they, they wanted more. It was awful. And he's looking at the pig's food and he's hungry. I've been in this job a while now. I've been in Christian ministry for 20 odd years and I love it. You, we do hatch, match, dispatch. I love doing weddings. It's amazing when we have kids and it's an, sometimes you can do funerals and you, people who love Jesus and it, oh, it's a great honor. And, and, but you, you see people in the best of the times and the worst of times. And I've encountered lots of different people in those moments where life just, life just hasn't worked out met people in prisons, or kind of met people who have the most phenomenal backgrounds. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. There comes a moment for people where they ask the question, is, it's just not worked out. I've tried it my way, it hasn't worked. What happens is with the, the, the younger brother, as he looks at the pig food, which for him would have been a symbol of how far he had fallen. He got money, got everything. And now he's got nothing. He literally has nothing. He has no way of saving himself. It's just this, this picture of how far he's fallen. And he thinks, oh, I'll go home. And so the scriptures tell us that there's almost like this, this realization, there's this kind of, there's this realization, this breakdown. So he's going to go home. And he comes up with a plan. He says, well, if I go home, because I can stay here and starve and eat pig food, salivating at pig food, well, I can go home. And if I go home, maybe they'll take me on. Because going home, he's lost his status as a son. So that's why the Bible says maybe they'll take him on as a, as a hired servant. Maybe just to kind of work around the farm. But it's better than death. So he sets off. Now, you imagine you're listening to this story, and you must think, wow, this Jesus character is amazing, and this story is crazy, because no one would go home after doing what they've done. It's a crazy story. And Jesus goes on, and he says, the father spots the boy, and he sees him in the distance. Now, bearing in mind, the father could have killed him. So people are listening in. What does he do? And he says, the father sees him. It's a kind of tense moment. But he says, what he does is he picks up his robe. He's a man of wealth, of stature. And he legs it. He runs. A respectable man in this culture never reveals their legs. And do you know what? I wish some people would follow that. And he lifts up his robe. A respectable man would never show his legs. He'd never run. But Jesus says, do you know, this father sees the boy. And he runs. Now, the son, 
the son has got the son has got a speech, and the, and the speech is I've 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 screwed everything up. I, I've I've come to the end of myself. The life hasn't worked out. I've uh, I've 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 messed it up. And this and this is this is this is what he says. He says um, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I have walked my own way. I have decided, he's saying, I've dishonored heaven. I've dishonored my, my tradition, my, 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 my beliefs, and I've dishonored you. And he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This is the sign of what Christians call repentance. It's like recognizing where life has become. I can't do this. Is that I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And, he's, and, and so the, the father sees him and he runs and he grabs his son. He, he throws his arms around him and he kisses him. The Greek says that, that it's almost like the father trips over himself. He grabs him. He embraces him. This is a, a picture by um, Charlie Mackesy. Uh, and he's, re- he's done loads of these pictures about the prodigal son. He did the boy, the fox, the whatever it is, that one. And um, he's, and he's done the prodigal daughter, and they're beautiful, and I love them. And it shows the, the passion that the father has for the boy. He just embraces him. So remember, this, the, son, the son thinks he's now a slave. He's going back as a slave. The father grabs him. The boy's taken responsibility. And there's this massive moment of restoration where the father says, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The robe, what does the robe mean? The robe is probably one of his. It's this restoration process where he says, you were a slave. You dishonored me, but I'm going to put a robe on you now. So, so when people see the robe, they see the father. It's a sign of restoration. And then they're going to give him a ring. And you know that ring is like giving you the family credit card. Are you for real? This guy is loaded. You're going to have so much fun. And he gives him the ring, and that ring has a signet. And where you go, you want to forget contactless. This is even better. You show that ring. Because you've got the, you've got the, the, you've got the shawl, you've got the cloak. And in the Hebrew culture, it's a sign of belonging. So you've got the cloak that says you belong, and then you've got the means which says you're the son. And it's confirmed because the boys come back barefooted like a slave. Feet and the dirt on the feet. And they say, get some, they say, get some, get some very best Birkenstocks. Because no son walks around like a slave. And it's this beautiful picture of restoration. So the story tells, the story describes the son who does his own thing, who lives his own life, takes autonomy, and it ends in disaster. The story describes the father who's not austere and angry and violent and as a patriarchal father, but one of, who is tender and loving and kind and merciful and gracious. And just imagine listening to this story now. It must be incredible. And then there's another brother. I love the older brother. He's amazing. Now, while this is all going on, while this waster is out spending all the money, he is grafting. Oh, yeah. He's working hard. He's not. He's the solid one, the one that you can depend on. He is not breaking the rules. He's not only in keeping the rules, but he's enforcing the rules. My eldest daughter now is 13, which means she can babysit. You know? So this is brilliant. Absolutely amazing. And I've got three kids. And she loves a bit of babysitting. Why? Because she can enforce the rules. And before we go out, she tells them where she will enforce the rules. She'd be a great lawyer, great prosecutor, or a great police officer. It is terrifying. My middle son, he's like, gives her the finger. He says, you just try. It is amazing. She's going to enforce the rules. 
So he's like been out there, he's grafting, he's working hard, and he gets near home and he can hear, da, 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 da. that's the old song we used to sing in the old days. You guys love it now. I know the 90s is cool again. It's back, isn't it? No, it's not. Okay, that's died. I'll carry on. And he's really angry. He is absolutely livid. He is unbelievably angry. And then there is this, ma- this massive altercation. And the, the Bible says the older brother became angry and refused to go in. Now, what's happened is that the, the, the thing that has really done it for him is the fattened calf, which is that big bull out there, which is only, which is, which is the burgers which you'd only eat at, the, at a wedding banquet. A wedding banquet, you see, in the scripture, the wedding banquet is the great feast, the f- speaking of the foretaste that is to come. And, there is this, um, and that's really ticked him off. What an extravagant, why would, you, why would you spend that? Why would you do all that? He's, he's a waste of what? Why would you do it? And he's so unbelievably angry. And he gets into an altercation with the father. He says the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, listen to this. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But what, listen to this. But when this son of yours, doesn't say his brother, he says when this son of yours who has squandered your property, actually it's also his property, with prostitutes oof, below the belt, comes home. You kill the fat calf for him. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And this is where Jesus is driving home the nub of the story. Because the people listening to Jesus, the Pharisees, are the older brother. I was the older brother. I'm a recovering older brother. Oh, I could be legalistic. Judgmental. You're looking down on people. You had two beers. When I went to university, I was teetotal. Man, you did not want to be around me. I was so intense. And what happens is, the older brother is living under the same roof as his father. But yet he's living like a slave. They live under the same roof, but they have no relationship. Because what is happening is Jesus is is making this very, very, very powerful point that it is important for us all to grasp hold of. He's saying to the older brother, you are trying to earn salvation. You're trying to earn approval through your works. You're saying, look at what I've all done for you. And when the event comes and anger overflows, the response is to say, look, this is what I do for you. You owe me. And what Jesus is saying, here is the younger son, the waster. He goes off. He does it all. He has an amazing time. He blows everything. He's bankrupt by the end. It is a complete disaster. His life falls apart. And yet he then comes home. He encounters Jesus. Sorry, encounters the Father, this who who is this epitome of grace. He's then restored back to the family. It is this beautiful image. And yet the older brother who looks the part, he could even lead a table at St. Thomas Crooks. He might even be in the Christian union. He looks at, he knows the Bible. Oh, yes, he does. His Instagram is full of sharing every Christian content you can think of. Yet his heart is hard. And Jesus says, he is more lost than the other boy. Because he thinks that to be loved, he has to earn it. 
And there's these beautiful words. They're in his anger, you see. And this is where if you're a Pharisee listening to this, you would feel the challenge setting in. Because he won't even go in the party. Because he's so angry. And he brings dishonor on his father because he won't even go in. And do you know what? The older brother at the banquet would serve the burgers. That was his job. Why? Because his job is to represent the father. And he doesn't. Because he's so angry and he's so disconnected from the father. And Jesus is saying that he is the true older brother. Because the older brother's job was to lay down his tools and go out and search the highways and the byways for that lost boy. And he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it because he's locked up in his own anger and his own religiosity. He doesn't know the father. And we don't know what happens to him. We just need a few more verses from Luke to say, and then they lived happily ever after. It was all good. We don't know that. But what we do know is Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, we have a calling. And our calling is to seek those who are far from him. And what stops us is when... We live with a mindset that says we're not loved. We have to earn it. When we're angry and we get bitter. And the father says, you are loved. In fact, what he says, let me quote him directly. He says, my son, my child, father says, you are always with me. You're always with me. And everything I have is yours. That's beautiful grace. To to the older boy, my son, the father says, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. You'll discover as we work through the Gospels and we look at the words that Jesus said, there was always a party. Do you know Christians should be party people? We're often not. We're often really just uptight and intense. But there's a party. Because there's something here which describes the absolute beauty and veracity and passion and just absolute wonderfulness. I think that might be a word, but some of you here at Sheffield University, you're super smart. You can tell me of the beauty and the life-changing grace of God. And if you're here today and you think, what the heck are these guys about? We would love to say, come on, Alpha. We'd love to share different stories of people who, who, who've encountered this grace and their lives have been changed. And that's the beauty of this story. <laughs> trying to, trying to, oh, hello. What's not happening? You're trying to tell me to, to finish. Is that what you're trying to do? I get the... I get the hints. I'm going to, I will finish now, actually. Thanks for the reminder. What says this? Which, which, which brother are you? Which brother are you? Which sister are you? The old one? Rocked up at Sheffield and there's... People drinking, do not know what time it is. You're the younger one. When I went to university, I had a secret plan to go crazy. And I met Christians on the first day. They invited me to church, I couldn't get away from them. But which one are you? And have you in- Counter the love of the Father. Not the wagging finger, which we often think he is. But the one, this is in Zephaniah, that he rejoices 
3.17, he says, he rejoices over us with singing. I used to do it with my kids when they were little. I try and do it now, but they're getting old and tell me to stop it. Have you encountered him? Because you can. And we'd love to pray with you today that your anxieties and your fears and all the stuff that has been spoken over you, which isn't true, will melt away as you feel in there, in your Noah, as they say in Sheffield. You know that. You've experienced it of a, of a love that is indescribable, the foretaste of heaven. And we'd love for you to encounter that today. Let's stand together.